Good morning and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival 2021 online. In this year of Scotland's coasts and waters, my name is Eric Walker and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session. Our speaker today is Professor Roger Crofts, who trained as a geographer and geomorphologist, and he is the founding chief executive of Scottish Natural Heritage. In retirement, he advises, lobbies, writes, and talks to, he says, anybody who will listen in Scotland, Iceland, and Europe on a range of vital issues. These include environmental strategy, policy, geo-heritage conservation, protected areas, and good governance. He says that he hopes to help people understand the Earth's heritage and environment and how to care for it more effectively. Today, Roger talks about the impact of rising sea levels, over-exploitation of resources, and asks, how do we cope? He looks for nature-based solutions and a holistic approach to the problem. This event is supported by the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. I want to encourage you all to take part in this event and ask you to please enter your comments and questions in YouTube's live chat, and I'll present them to Roger after he's completed his talk. Roger, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Eric. A warm welcome to everyone listening. It's a pity I can't be in the Orkney Islands, a wonderful place, but I will show you some examples, including that aerial shot of Sandy on the picture there. So in the next slide, please. I want first to talk about the natural and human conflict at the coast by way of introduction, to then go on to talk about the emerging challenges with examples from two different parts of Europe, and then to reflect uh, under eight headings, what can we do to reduce conflict? So let's get going, please. Next one. The coast, of course, is naturally dynamic. We've skipped one, thanks. Um, you know, e even on the rocky coast, like here on the west coast of, of Hoy, the old man is not going to be there forever, but there are some young men in Rora Head, as you can see on the right-hand picture, ready to take its place. But in the past, as this next slide shows, we've had uh, huge collisions naturally at the coast where continents have collided, where the tectonic plates meet, as is shown on the maps on the next slide, when we had uh, an ocean between sort of proto-England and proto-Scotland in its various bits, those pink things in the edge of Laurentia, the ocean closed with a huge great crash and we got the, the, the joining uh, of what we now know as the British Isles. And that was something around 400 million years ago. Next, please. Much more recently, we have a, 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 a tremendous variation in where the coastline was as a result of sea level uh, change, which is shown on this graph over the last 140,000 years, for example, but also of the land itself uh, uh, changing its, its height, either due to the tectonic movements of the continental plates or because of the loading and then unloading of the weight of ice. So we have this pattern. You'll see the sea level rise uh, there on the right hand side of the graph and then roughly leveling off at the present day. But it's not quite that that just now as the graph on the next slide shows, uh, where you will see uh, in the last few years the, the, the rate of increase has, has gone up considerably, 3.1 millimeters per year. It doesn't sound much, but it's significantly different from you know, 100, 120 years ago. And that has uh, two real components as shown on the next graph. Uh, firstly, you will, I'm sure, all have heard about the thermal expansion of the oceans as a result of uh, the rise in average global temperature and also the absorption of carbon dioxide in the oceans. 
And if you, and that's the red line at the bottom of the graph, and you, then we add in uh, additional water, mainly melt water uh, from the climatic effect on major ice caps, particularly the West Greenland, sorry, the West Antarctic ice cap, and also the Greenland ice cap and the melting of the uh, uh, Arctic Ocean. But some parts of the coast, as the picture in the next slide shows, are still uh, accreting sand. Uh, the largest area of sand accumulation and coastal aggradation, as we call it, building out, is here on the mouth of the Tay. At the south side, you can see the Abate Sands, as they call that long spit and Tent Muir Point. But there's a tremendous variation within the intertidal area, as you see on the next slide, of two statues uh, built by Anthony Gormley on the beach, on the outer part of the Mersey estuary at Crosby. They were put at the same time, but look at the difference in the height of the sand now, in the lower beach on the left and then the upper beach on the right. So there's all that variation happening naturally uh, throughout time. On the map coming up, if we look at the Scottish coast, it's comprised of different components. So a, a large majority, particularly along the east coast of Scotland, is a sand dune, Macca on the west coast, uh, in other words, soft, soft coast, uh, sea cliffs as, as all the red, as you will know in Orkney and the other isles, and particularly in Western Scotland, uh, salt marsh in the inner parts of estuaries, and then some areas of shingle. I show this because it's important to recognise that some areas in the context of rising sea level are much more vulnerable to coastal erosion and coastal retreat, particularly sandy areas. And the sea, of course, is very ferocious, as we can see the results on the picture here at Herman S in uh, northwest mainland Shetland with the boulders on the top of the cliff and the cliffs that are 100, 120 feet high. And these boulders have been thrown up there in stormy seas. So if you add sea level rise to that component, uh, then that makes it even more so. But the sea can have an advantageous effect for nature, as we see on the next slide at Marwick Head, where the bedded sandstones have been etched out as a result of the different uh, resistance or weakness to wave action and giving these lovely uh, nesting sites that you see in the inset on the right hand side for the various types of orcs and, and kittiwakes, for example. But it can have a very negative effect as we see at the sands of St. Cyrus, uh, where the beach has been lowered by the North Esk estuary coming out. This is on the Angus Kincardineshire border just north of Montrose and the sand dunes are in a great retreat. And I was there uh, not so long back and some particular parts of that ecosystem within the National Nature Reserve, particularly the old river channels, which were salt marsh, are now no longer there. And in softer coasts, as you see in Norfolk on the next picture, uh, after heavy rain, the slopes become very unstable and they just slump down onto the, onto the beach. They're all natural actions. And there's a wonderful example in Orkney, and I hope I've got this right as on the next slide, because most people have never heard of Scarabray because it was hidden uh, under the sand and in the protection of a sandbar. And this uh, pictographic reconstruction, you can see the sandbar, uh, but there was a huge storm which knocked the start sandbar down and eroded the edge of the coast and lo and behold unearthed uh, this wonderful settlement site. So there are lots of variations therefore in, in the coast as a result of natural actions. But let's now think of the human interference on the coast. Next slide please. Uh, we are, you're familiar with you know, huge waves hitting built structures like at our Broth Harbour on the on the right, 
or at the entrance to Aberdeen Harbour on the left. Of course, humans can have a very constructive effect and borrow things uh, to help cultivation, like you see with the seaweed on the next slide, which is quite near St Magnus Cathedral in, in Kirkwall. Uh, quite a benign effect because people uh, are just collecting this from the beach. Uh, but it can be much, much worse in other situations or in many places, as the next slide shows, uh, in the tropics where the native vegetation, the mangrove uh, swamps have been removed uh, for vast areas of fish ponds like this on the west coast of Ecuador near Guayaquil. Uh, as a result, uh, there is no natural protection because the mangrove swamps, uh, uh, which you see on the next slide, it is a tremendous uh, protector. Uh, it enables you to um, uh, be, form a natural barrier to the uh, waves uh, and sea level rise. It's rooted into, into the ground. And it's rather like the debates we've been having in Scotland. Should we be cutting down the kelp forest as a form of cellulose for uh, all sorts of modern technologies. And then we begin to realize, of course, that that's not a good idea because it's a natural barrier uh, against the, the energy of the waves near the coast. Or we can go to an even greater extreme, as we see on the next slide, uh, near Christchurch and at the edge of Poole Harbor, where we can, where we just put in the summer houses along the beach and it's uh, overdevelopment in extremis. And we also read, as we can see on the next slide, about lots of rubbish that is dumped in the ocean and these great areas of plastic in parts of the Pacific, for instance. And that ought to be brought home to us after a, a, a storm on any beach. This is on, on the Mersey estuary, but I see it uh, also on my home bit of coast, because I live by Musselburgh and on the Fisher Road Sands. Fortunately, back home, we have a whole squad of people who, who tidy it up. But one of the worst influences of human intervention uh, in the sea is, of course, the type of fishing activity we have. And look at the fishing vessel, the Icelandic fishing vessel on the next picture in the harbour of Hürp in southeast Iceland and look at those huge uh, metal boards, the trawl boards there. Or on the next picture, uh, a huge great mechanical sieve which is uh, towed along the seabed. And the consequence of that is shown in the diagram on the next slide. This is what we call bottom trawling. Um, the description there on that slide says it all. Really, it totally um, uh, wrecks the habitat because of the weight of these big metal uh, pieces to hold the net down. It gives the sediment plume into the water. And often there is a lot of unwanted fish, what's called the bycatch. As And look at the trawl intensity, you can see there's an example in the Barents Sea on the next slide, where the darker the colour, the greater intensity in the number of hours of trawling, particularly around the, the North Cape area of Finnmark in northern Norway and around uh, Bear Island to, to the north there. Tremendous intensity. And the consequences of that are shown on the next slide with you know, huge uh, corals being pulled off the seabed. These take many, many uh, decades to grow, or fish that are not wanted, the bycatch, uh, compared with what was the target species, for instance. And this activity is really quite mindless. And we have a major problem in terms of fishing overall, as the next slide shows, with uh, a lot of, of very expensive boats tied up much of the time, like these 
uh, big ocean going boats in Killybegs Harbour in Donegal. And look at the statistics on the right hand side. I particularly point out the first one 75% of the world's fishing stocks are now over exploited or fully exploited. And there's huge amounts of money going into the fishing industry. And look at the next graph to show you, uh, in terms of tons, the different types of fishing activity. The small scale, you see, is very insignificant in the total, and it's still the industrial fishing. And I was amused very recently where my local fish merchant in Fisher Road uh, said to me, well, of course, there aren't any industrial fishes anymore. Well, this is an internationally accepted graph and there are industrial fisheries and you can see the scale of them. And also that on top of that, the discard issue as well, which I mentioned earlier. And if you look at the overview picture, which is shown on the next slide, look at uh, the decline in the total number of fish stocks that are underfished and the increase in the fully fished and even greater the increase in the overfish so that the international sources say uh, that most of the fishing grounds around uh, the world are now overfished and yet the fishing industry receives tremendous amount of subsidies as the bar chart on the next slide shows and I want to, you to notice the difference between the beneficial application of those subsidies in the dark blue, and it's only in the USA that that's greater than the harmful uh, effect of those subsidies on the fish stocks. So it's not a really good balance at all. So let's think now about emerging challenges and give you two examples. Next slide, please. And next again, I've mentioned already sea level rise, and you'll have seen a lot of commentary in the press, particularly the latest IPCC report. Uh, this graph shows uh, the predictions to the end of the century. Is it going to be eight inches? Nobody really thinks that, it, that at all. Is it going to be uh, two meters? Could well be, but what do we design for? What do we plan for? It's going to be certainly something in the intermediate to high level. And what effect on, on Scotland? Well, it will be differential as the next slide shows uh, with the predictions there. As, uh, sorry, Northern Isles uh, is going to be much greater on the uh, uh, in the Northern Isles, and they've been sinking for a long time as the, as the rebound effect uh, of the rising of the mainland as a result of uh, the melting of the ice cap. And if you add to that, as the next slide shows, uh, increasing storminess of the sea, here's just an example of a storm uh, some 12 years ago in the Bay of Biscay, and we're going to get a lot of that. We've seen a lot of that. And we must also remember, as the diagram next shows us, uh, that the sea is always on the move because there's always eddies and currents and tidal currents and material uh, coming from the rivers as here and the Loire and the, and the Giron, for instance. Uh, so it's a very dynamic environment. And also, as the Next slide shows we've got a lot of uh, variation in sea surface temperature. It has a great advantageous effect, of course, on our climate and weather systems. Uh, but that may stop if the ocean circulation is affected as the, the, the graph, the map on the next slide shows. The upper one is the current situation where we have this beneficial North Atlantic Oscillation, to give it its posh name, what we colloquially call the Gulf Stream. But if the amount of, of fresh water coming off Greenland ice cap and off the um, Arctic Ocean uh, increases further, as is predicted, then that might switch off that oscillation with a dramatic effect on our climate and weather systems. 
So I want to give you an example, and let's start off with the Baltic, please, next slide, as a coastal conflict zone. The Baltic's not really a sea, it's a series of semi-enclosed basins, as you'll see in this map, with a very narrow connection through the Kattegat uh, to uh, the North Sea. The next diagram shows you the extent of the problem. The brighter the red, the greater the degree of eutrophication in, in these basins, uh, obviously, particularly in the southern area, as you can see there. And if you look at the concentrations of cyanobacteria on the next slide, over a 10 year period, you'll see the larger number is in red of the number of days in each of those years. And it gives you a good indication of concentrations of these pollutants that are creating the problem there. And if we look at the bar chart of, sorry, the pie chart of the sources of nitrogen, uh, then we'll see, okay, a lot from distant sources, uh, but look at the amount coming in from Germany and Poland, and that's largely from uh, agricultural land. And if we look at the water catchment uh, area map, uh, then the paler green shows the catchment and look at all of the sources of fresh water that are flowing into these semi-enclosed basins in the Baltic Sea, uh, which uh, create the problem. And if you add on that, the map of population density, which is the next slide, then you will see this tremendous concentration, especially southern, southern Finland, Denmark, southern Sweden, and uh, Germany, Poland, and the Baltic states. And it's very important in looking at these situations in the Baltic to look at the causes. And this chart on the next slide, it looks like a complex picture, uh, but it all points, as it said, right at the bottom there, the bottom box, high vulnerability. And just look at the flow line coming down the left-hand side. It's a shallow sea, small volume, long residence time of water. And then at the middle one, semi-enclosed sea, restricted water exchange, brackish water. And then if you add to that, uh, the inputs on the right hand side, large population, hazardous some, uh, substances, etc. You do get that eut eutrophication, which I was talking about earlier, which is a real problem. Next picture, of course, tremendous amount of industrial activity, especially on the rivers. This is the Neva in at St. Petersburg, but you can say that of the other major rivers, particularly flowing the Elbe and the Vistula, for instance, flowing from uh, the, in northwards. And also the picture of next, which shows uh, the amount of friable soils uh, uh, deposited in the late glacial period. Uh, and if the fertilizers are poorly applied, and, or over uh, supplied onto this land, of course, they just wash into the rivers and then into the Baltic Sea. And add to that the fish stock decline graphs, which come next, you will see there the decline in cod, uh, the decline in, <coughs> excuse me, in, in herring uh, there. So, Finally, on this example, is the Baltic Sea still a mess? I ask the question. Next slide, please. Yes, because there are natural problems. The water stays too long in these semi-enclosed basins, and seawater incursions through the, the from the Skagerrak and through the Kattegat uh, are very rare. Every five to seven years, maybe. And add to that all the human-induced uh, pollution that I've talked about. But on the other hand, it is getting better. There's in international cooperation uh, through the Helsinki Convention, the clear plan of action, new national and EU laws and regulations, better information and effective action.
Let's turn to a more uh, a smaller scale, a more local example to me. Next slide, please. Coastal conflict of Musselburgh. Here's an overview of the town of Musselburgh with the estuary of the Esk. The land uh, to the uh, right is all reclaimed behind a bund of pumped, uh, spent uh, waste from the Kakenzie power station, which you can see in the top right of the picture. It's no longer there. It was closed in 2013. Whereas the bit of coast uh, to the on the left side of the picture is, is natural. Uh, but we have an issue about uh, flooding and the Scottish government has, uh, has voted 42 million pounds for a flood protection scheme for the river uh, and, and the coast to protect the properties. We, we basically have, uh, have uh, a natural problem here as the map next shows because these two rivers, the North Esk rising in the Pentland Hills and the South Esk in the Moorfoot Hills are what we call flashy. In other words, they rise very quickly after a precipitation event because they're very short river courses from the uplands to the sea. The river channel gradient is very steep. Uh, the river is incised uh, and it means there's a very limited floodplain for it to uh, to, to spread out onto. If we then turn to the next issue, which is, of course, uh, the sea. We have high spring tides every lunar month. Um, we have the storm surges, which we can't really predict, but we know they occur. And often at the same time, we get a wind southwards across the estuary. And all of these things, of course, raise the level of the water by anything up to uh, two, three or even four meters. The effect of that in the estuary itself is, of course, uh, to stop the river water draining out to sea for maybe up to two hours either side of high water. And the consequence of that is shown on the on the next picture of flooding. This was the flood in December 2013. But of course, if we think about it, what are we going to do? We've got a flood protection scheme with money voted for it, uh, but we can't stop the sea and we can't always predict what it's going to do. So what do we do? Next slide. Do we build a seawall along the coast? The engineers, of course, are thinking about that, just like they've constructed one here in, in Weems, uh, the south coast of Fife. Or do we build a wall along the river, which blocks the view from our houses? As the next slide shows for Hoyt, for instance, and I show this because this is the scheme uh, that's currently being put in place with two metre high uh, walls to protect the town from the river, uh, done by the same consultants, the same consulting engineers and the con same construction company is, is working on uh, the muscle bristle. Well, to me, and I speak as a geographer, geomorphologist, environmental manager, that's not the right way. Next slide, please. What we should be looking at is how we can work better with nature. Here's the catchment map with the dotted line of the Esk, the North Esk and the South Esk. What we really need to do is to slow water runoff uh, from the land. It's been totally overgrazed, it's been drained. Uh, we need to plant more native species in the appropriate places. We need to block drains. We need to remove the artificial obstacles of the weirs and channels, which were constructed for the industrial period for the mills, particularly in Pennycook and Musselburgh. And in the modern developments, we've got to get the planning and the building regulation authorities with the house builders to stop sealing the land surface with development and to use more natural knee methods so water just percolates into the soil rather than dashing down the drains. And we've got to open up the floodplains as well, even though that might mean giving compensation to farmers, which I think would be a good, a good thing. Uh, when we finally get round in Scotland to developing the post common agriculture, uh, agricultural scheme. And once we get to the coast, as the picture shows next, here, 
nature can take its course. Uh, I'm told by people who were born and brought up in this uh, section of the coast between the river mouth and the Fisher Row Harbour that this beach is now uh, three, four metres higher. And recent uh, planting and natural growth of the vegetation means that we have this sort of result. And this is a nat natural protection of the coast, but it's not working entirely as the next picture shows. There is a little cliff um, after uh, periods of stormy weather. And what do we do about that to protect the property that you see in the left, top left hand corner of the slide? So let's come to the final section of this talk. Then next slide, please. What are the solutions to reduce some of these conflicts that I've raised in these two examples and the other background factors? And this, in, in summarizing, I, I want to talk about eight different issues. So first is, and I always start with this sort of point. Next slide, please, is to... Uh, what I call a green ethical basis. You know, we have a responsibility as human society to look after the future, not just exploit things for our own benefit now. And one example of this is what's called the Commonwealth Blue Charter of shared values and a shared ocean. And it's based on cooperation and knowledge share, and it's got principles and it's got a plan of action. Next, uh, we need to collect data to inform decisions. I was involved in my Aberdeen University days of a, a huge uh, assessment of all the sandy beaches around Scotland. Uh, and we went out and tramped all of these beaches. This is just an example of our uh, conclusions about optimum use and recommended restrictions for part of North Argyll, for example. Uh, but there's a much greater assessment. Next slide, please called Dynamic Coast, Scotland's Coastal Change Assessment, uh, led by Jim Hansen at Glasgow University and undertaken on behalf of the Scottish Government. And I suggest you go into this website, Dynamic Coast Scotland's NCCA, because it has detailed maps of coastal change in the post-war period. And it's a huge data set which can better inform decision making. Next, please. And we also need to make sure that we apply all the knowledge that the uh, fisheries marine scientists have brought together that is just summarized in this type of diagram uh, of the interactions in the food chain at the different trophic levels in the ocean. Next, please. But we have to ask the question, are we going to continue to take the usual engineering approach you know, with the seawall and the groins, these are uh, uh, in Aberdeen Bay. Is that the right approach? Next, please. Or, or this uh, seawall in Montrose uh, to protect a bit of uh, recreational infrastructure and hopefully, hopefully to protect the golf course behind it in the links. But as the next slide shows, there are difficulties with these sort of seawall approaches. There's what's been known for many decades as the end seawall effect. In other words, when you get to the end of the seawall, the, the sea gets in behind it, as this uh, shows on the south side of the Tweed. Or on the next slide, on the Norfolk coast, which is very prone to uh, coastal erosion. Uh, doesn't matter what you put there, it can be wrecked in heavy seas and storm surges. So what does, I, so you can see I'm not really in favor of that approach. I'm in favor of what I show on the next slide is what I call the nature-based solutions. And this is an approach which is developing the more we understand how nature works and the more we can mimic it, work with it. And it means two quite simple things. Uh, one is shown in this uh, rather curious diagram here, looking at the whole catchment. And I've already referred to that sort of approach for the Esks in the Lothians, for instance, and also looking at the land-sea interactions. And that means, as the next map shows, looking at the natural units of the coast to determine action. It's what we call coastal cells. And my colleagues in 
Scottish Natural Heritage divides these coastal shell uh, cells. That's like uh, the famous Leith Policeman quote, isn't it? Um, uh, to uh, so that you could accurately look at different section of the coast as a natural entity. And we can also, as the next picture shows, mimic nature by rebuilding sand dunes, uh, by planting the natural dune grasses like marron grass, or as the next slide shows, give nature a helping hand. This is the famous Calgary uh, Bay on Mull, which was a total wreck when I assessed it in about 1970. Uh, but fences were put up and now it's a much more stable environment and they took our advice and didn't allow cars and caravans to be placed on the fragile maca. So you can move things forward if you if you understand nature a bit more, use the right sort of plants like you see on the next picture, which is the uh, the coarser marum grass and then the finer uh, sea lime grass, uh, which is here being used along the coast uh, by North Berwick in East Lothian, for example or a very good example further westwards along the coast is at Gillen, where this dune that you see there, and you can see the scale of it, but the people on the beach didn't exist at all. The sea was washing right inland. And uh, Frank Tyndall, a wonderful county planning officer decades back, uh, thought they should try and rebuild the dune and look what's happened. And they, they just mimic nature by just putting material that are along the drift line at the top of the beach and, and planting grasses, and that's the, what happens. But that's not the only way of doing it. We also need, as the next slide shows, uh, is to protect, regulate, and enforce uh, the protection and regulation. Here, for instance, and may, many of you may not have seen this, the huge extent in... Uh, our waters of marine protected areas, the, the, the dark blue there and the other area-based measures, which are, um, are more limited in extent. Um, this is a tremendous uh, change, I have to say, as a result of our membership of the EU and the implementation of the Habitats and Species Directive, which is still uh, relevant and still live because it's now uh, in uh, the regulations at the UK and Scottish levels. And let me give you one example on the next slide of the Karen Marine Conservation Order approved by the Scottish Parliament a couple of years ago. And these are the words from uh, the order. Uh, in other words, you can't fish within these areas. So it doesn't matter what sort of gear you have, none at all. And that means that these are sanctuaries for spawning of certain sorts of marine creatures. But they're not going to work despite this regulation unless it's adequately policed and enforced. And that's why I've put there in that photograph, one of the vessels of the Scottish uh, Fishery Protection Agency. When I did a review of sea fisheries law enforcement in the ninth, early eighties, um, it was a whole series of different things not working together. As a result, we, they're now all pulled together in a unified way, but it has to be done to understand, if you like, the deterrent effect of regulation and patrolling. Next is uh, to make sure that we have international accords, that they are signed uh, multinationally and they're effectively implemented. Otherwise we might have the effects as this cartoon is depicting, of uh, the sea uh, uh, bashing at the, at the base of the United Nations building in New York. And we have three of these, as the next picture shows, of, uh, for the Mediterranean Sea, the Barcelona Convention, in the Baltic Sea, which I've already talked about, the Helsinki Convention, and then one for the North uh, East Atlantic called OSPAR. And these are extremely important, multi national multilateral agreements uh, to make sure that there is common objectives and agreed plans of action. But next one, please. Do we think and do the unusual? Uh, you know, the Dutch are the masters, aren't they, at protecting their 
coastline, some of which is below sea level or the land in behind it is below sea level, uh, as this picture shows here. And people have even floated ideas about a dam across the northern North Sea and across the English Channel in the southwest approaches. I happen to think that those ideas are crazy. But you can see what they're getting at. How do we have a handle through these big geoengineering projects uh, of coping with sea level rise? I, I doubt it. We have to use simpler techniques, but as the next slide shows, they, they are pretty intrusive. Here we are in Norfolk with the classic step sea wall and the, uh, and the curved top of the wall to make sure that the waves tilt back. Uh, the very uh, high dense rocks coming from uh, Norway and dumped along the coast. And then these mini islands made of uh, used tires, for example. Uh, we can't do that along the whole coast, surely. Therefore, as the next slide shows, do we have to protect uh, places that are particularly important? Uh, like here at Montrose, the mouth of the South Esk estuary, the Glaxo uh, Klein uh, pharmaceutical factory, where there has been a very successful coastal protection uh, scheme. Uh, sometimes though, as the next picture shows, we have to think about uh, managing the retreat of the coastline uh, where the land inland could be used for a different purpose to store seawater uh, by, for instance, as this picture shows here at Nig Bay in the Cromarty Firth, breaching uh, a sea wall and letting it flood in. And finally, what do we do about, um, last slide please, uh, well, it's not the uh, next slide. Uh, sorry, can you go back? Considering moving people and relocating infrastructure. Here's a case in Norfolk. There's no way that that caravan site can survive. Uh, the, the capital assets in the caravans will be lost if they're not moved inland, for example. Or in the next uh, picture, that building is not going to be able to survive irrespective of the protection work at the coastal edge itself and it won't be insurable either. Or there is the very vexed question, next slide, of the of golf courses at the coast, the famous Lynx courses, the, the, the one Baunagoan course just north of, uh, of the Don Mouth in Aberdeen, where my colleague is standing on the first tee, for instance, or uh, the erosion of the coast of, of St Andrews, bearing in mind that the coast is accreting and building out much further north between uh, this river estuary and the Tay, uh, but St Andrews is, is uh, very vulnerable and that's a very knotty question, isn't it, to try and address. Last slide. So there are lots of things for us to contemplate as my son-in-law and my granddaughter stand on the beach looking for a wonderful sunset of what can we do? And as I've demonstrated, there are not there are traditional ways of doing things which maybe not provide a long-term solution. What we've got to do, of course, is to be creative. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much for that, Roger. That was extremely thorough. Um, I recognize so many of those places in your photographs. I was born and raised in Brechin in the East. So I recognise all the, from Aberdeen, uh, right down in Troza, both St Cyrus. I'll tell you what, I always noticed, see from about the 70s when the oil industry was being developed, and there were huge areas on the coast that were being turned over to industrial sites and retail parks uh, and covered in concrete and tarmac. And, you know, as a local fellow, you wondered how on earth is this going to, you know, sustain itself in some of the East Coast storms that we get residential areas that were built on hochs, you know, natural river floodplains. We, we used to joke about never buy a place that's got a, st a street with hoch in, in, in the world. And, and you're seeing that now, you're seeing these places yeah. flooding, you know? Yeah. Um, we've only got time. We've only got time for a, a, a couple of, uh, uh, a couple of questions because we're running out of time. There was a, there's big debates uh, or, or points being made regarding fishing. Um, 
as you, you may not, uh, you'll, that'll not surprise you, I'm sure. Uh, some of the ones were trawling. It's clearly very damaging. You know, are there methods of controlling the height of the net above the seabed being developed? There's a, another comment in there saying that there's a, Icelandic trawlers that have pelagic doors, you know, so there's fishing above the, the, the sea. So there must be some technical solutions to that. There are, I mean, there are lots of technical solutions. I, I mean, I'm aware of over many, many years, the research that's been done at, you know, the old Torrey Research Lab, as well as at the Marine Lab in Aberdeen, uh, of looking at these different methods. The fact of the matter is that you still go. I mean, that Icelandic photograph I showed was taken um, about three weeks ago. Um, and they, they have problems. And if, if, you, if you go to some of the harbours, and the fishermen don't like this, but the fact of the matter is that they are still using these heavy things, which we generically call trawl boards. And there's always been a dispute with the inshore fishermen who are using gentle techniques, uh, you know, with lobster pots and uh, for, um, uh, for that type of fishing or scallop. You know, in, why are you catching scallops with using scallop dredges, which is damaging the birthplace of the next scallops when you've got scallop divers? Okay, they um, cost much more per scallop, but there's a huge international market for these sorts of, uh, of, of, of marine animals, uh, for instance, in restaurants in the major cities of Europe. I, I sometimes feel that maybe the, you know, the fishermen are the last of the hunter gatherers, and yet the technology is there for these different approaches, which you hinted at yourself, Eric, and I think it needs more negotiation and more regulation to make sure that these these things happen. Yeah, regarding negotiation and regulation, it was in, that that Baltic example was I thought was very good. Um, you know where you see the, the the impact of the waters on lots of different countries. Mm -hmm. They have to get together to cooperate and, and, yeah. and work. And it was good to see that there's the Helsinki plan. And yeah, you know you're, you're complimentary of it, but you know is it ambitious enough? Is it uh, uh, is it is it is it being enacted quickly enough? You know that, that's what concerns the like of myself. Well, you, 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 you know that's why I talked about the land sea interaction as well because you can't. I mean, there are some things you can't solve about the Baltic because of these enclosed basins, and uh, but you can solve the the problem of the input of pollutants from the landward side. You know, by cleaning up the industry on on the big rivers. Uh, um, by, you know, the Rhine going into the southern North Sea, which is very shallow, for instance, or you can uh, clean up the, the way that they use fertilizers on these very friable soils that, that uh, can wash into the main rivers like the Vistula, uh, by using, you know, much more direct drilling techniques. Why do you have to plow, deep plow the land all the time? Why can't we use the techniques that uh, that have been talked about for many years uh, by the you know for organic agriculture, for instance, where you're using these low tillage techniques, which means that you maintain uh, the capital asset, the soil, and you're not having these detrimental effects uh, downstream as well. So it's all there. Uh, we need to have the creative policy making, which is linking all of these different systems together. So we have, if you like, if I can call it that, a, an earth systems approach as opposed to approach that looks at agricultural land use approach that looks at economic development yeah. and have put them all together. We haven't got that in Scotland and we've just got a new planning act, but it doesn't do that sort of thing. And we're still waiting for the post EU agricultural and land stewardship package uh, from the government. Yeah, to me as a, a person looking outside in, it just doesn't feel quite joined up. I, I, I was involved, my career, I was involved in whiskey distilling and barley, of course, yeah, one of sure. you know, key, key um, raw material for us. And, uh, you know, farmers have got out of the habit of rotating crops and they just deep plowed every year and put molten barley, molten barley, molten barley in the same field and used chemical fertilisers mm -hmm. to control it and encourage it to give the biggest yield. So, Economic agriculture has got to be a driver that's 
got to be overcome somehow. You know, it's, it's difficult. It's, and I'm sure it's the same with fishing as, as well. Yeah, but, it, you know, why we still have a, 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 an agriculture support system that is based on land you own, as opposed to how you steward that land, we're going to continue with the problem. Yeah. Yeah, there's actually an interesting question come in regarding uh, fishing, and it was a question for us from Howie, actually. And he's going, um, is the quota system the best way to manage fish stocks? Is it, what about, you know, the days at sea system? That's, that's, I know it's been tried. Um, well, I, I don't think so, because, you know, people sell quotas. Uh, so, you know, you have the biggest, most proficient boats uh, doing all the work. And we've actually in, unwittingly restructured the industry to those that can afford the largest and most efficient vessels, as opposed to having, remember the graph I showed of the industrial compared with the, the small scale artisanal type fishing. Uh, the, the, the structure of the industry has ch changed. And we've spent, you know, tens of millions in decommissioning schemes um uh, and we've got all these boats tied up uh, but we still haven't always got the, the 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 biomass and the catch in balance and th there is this reluctance by the fishing industry and its leaders to accept the science always because they always say well of course we know because we're out there we know better and i've heard this said so often to the face of the people that are running these high, you know, highly scientific, uh, um, objective research at places like the, the, whatever it's called these days, the old marine lab in Aberdeen, for instance. Yeah, yeah actually, Neil Matheson, I'm sure you know, he was, he's, he's going, you know, quota is a tradable asset, as you've just said, and uh, yeah. given some stats, you know, about the, the, the quota, that the, the foreign owned elements of the, the quotas, um, it's got Northern Ireland quotas owned by one boat. I mean, my goodness, yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing. Uh, I did not know yeah. that. Um, that's uh, yes, I think it's called Monopoly, isn't it, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it, it fuels it, that, that sort of monopoly stick approach. Yeah, are there examples? Are there examples of coastal control or fishing control or agricultural control anywhere in the world that actually that works on a, a reasonable scale? Yeah, well. It's, I heard a few years ago a debate between a sort of marine conservationists and, and prawn fishermen in the great Australian bight, you know, in northern Australia. And it was fascinating because the case for protecting the spawning areas um, was actually made by the fishermen rather than by the conservationists uh, because it had become clear to them that the way they were doing things in the past, and they said traditionally it must have been right because we've still got these things to catch, uh, wasn't the right approach for the future to safeguard you know, their industry and future generations. And bearing in mind, you know, quite often fish are, fishing is an intergenerational activity. And they were very strongly arguing at an international forum these are the fishermen saying we need more of these protection areas, which will ultimately safeguard our livelihoods. Yeah, you know, there's a comment on in here yes. in agreement with you. Fish are a commercial harvest. They are yeah. always caught in the same areas which have been fished for many decades, yeah. and probably longer. These areas should be designated as fish production sites. I think that's uh, pretty much mm. the of what you've just said, Roger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very interesting. You know, I've not done any work in Iceland uh, on the marine side, but I've talked to marine scientists uh, and they said, you know, since they uh, took over their exclusive economic zone in, in the 70s, they, they took about 25, 30 years to get the fish stock and the fish catching in balance. It mm. took that long just as a single national entity. It was partly because of that, right throughout that period, uh, fish exports were, was the mainstay of the Icelandic economy. Now that it isn't, there are other things that have taken its place. Uh, that they've slowly brought things in balance, but they've still got the problem of these massive ships 
um, uh, which cost a lot of money, um, sitting in the harbour a lot of the time with catching capacities well beyond anything we'd conceived of before, probably. Well, Roger, time has beaten us, as it always does. <laughs> Uh, can I just first of all start by thanking our audience for actively taking part and submitting some extremely perceptive questions and comments. And of course, Roger, thank you so much for that enlightening and thought-provoking talk. Um, I, I personally leave with a lot more mulling through my mind and environmental <laughs> conscience than an hour ago. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And now, can... We invite you to join us for lunch at 12.45pm. It's a mixture of guests with topics ranging from astronomy and travel to foraged food for lunchtime. If you're enjoying the festival, please consider donating. Full details of how to do so are below. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram and follow our YouTube channel. And remember... The Festival Club will be open this evening at half past nine, where we can further discuss some of the topics that have been presented today. Thank you and goodbye for now. <laughs>